Amen. That's a wonderful thought. But let's take it one step further. What will you be doing when he comes? Where will you be? Will you be doing what you're supposed to be doing? Say, I want to be right in the act of winning somebody to the Lord. Well, that would be great. But I'm not going to try to time that. I just want to do what I'm supposed to do every moment of every day. Are you going to be standing where God wants you to be standing when he comes? Or will you have slept? The title of our message tonight is Stand Fast. Stand fast. Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Pages are still turning. It's a short verse. Let's look at it again. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. In this one verse, in this one sentence, we have the conclusion of the previous section, of the, really of the previous large section, and the thesis of the next section, the topic of the next section. And so that gives this verse double importance. We're not going to cover both of those important parts of the verse tonight. We'll look at the first one, but let's just think about that a little bit. There's a therefore there, right? Therefore. So that means this is a conclusion. He's told us to do something, and we say, okay. And then he says something else, and we say, okay, that's good. He tells us another truth. We think, that's true, sure enough. And we should be thinking along the way, so then, so then what? what not so what, but so then what should I do with these things that you've been telling me, Apostle Paul? And so he comes to this conclusion, therefore, because I've told you this, and this, and this, and this, everything that we can see before it says, therefore, do this, stand fast in the Lord. And then the word so, the word so says, um, gives us the idea of uh, an introduction to what's to follow, so as we read the verses that follow, or when we get to reading the verses that follow, we'll see that uh, we should do a certain thing. And we should think, now, what, what, what is this helping me to do? And then we read another thing that it tells us to do, and we should think, now, what is this helping me to do? And so the word so means, in this way, stand fast in the Lord. Now, tonight, we're just going to talk about standing fast. It's important especially in this day and age. But if you study the passage, you'll see that he tells us how to stand fast, and we will get to those the next time I get to preach or if someone else decides to jump in there and tell us about it. So we have a conclusion and a thesis in this verse. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given us, that you've just given us your word. Lord, if we didn't have your word, we would be like any, all the rest of the heathen in the world, grasping in the dark, wondering, putting our own thoughts toward what it is that uh, we could do to please an unknown God. But Lord, you've made yourself known to us in your word. And your word tells us that you've made yourself known to the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Thank you that um, we can learn from your word. Thank you that you've made it available to us, that we have it, that we know it's what's right from you. And then, Lord, help us tonight as we look at this small portion of it to understand that we shouldn't just get warm feelings because we have your word. We should follow your word. We should let it affect us. We should let it affect change the way that we think. It, we should let 
our thinking that's been changed by your word affect the way that we live, the choices that we make, the decisions that we, we uh, do and that we take. And so, Lord, as we look at this, your word tonight, uh, I pray that you would uh, allow me to make it plain. Um, and I pray that as we look at your word, that we'd allow your spirit to speak to us. That we wouldn't be um, distracted by myself or by something else, but that your word could convince us of, of a need that we have in our lives and, or, or just encourage us to keep, uh, keep at what you've given us to do in our lives. And I ask that you'd receive glory from this. I ask that our church would be strengthened so that we could as a church give you glory because of these, this message, these words from, your, uh, from the scripture tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I was looking back at my records and I don't, I don't preach very often on Sunday evening. And uh, my first message from Philippians was in 2017. So if you're visiting back from a long time ago, he said, yes, we are still in Philippians. Um, one year, I only preached once on a Sunday night, so that, I didn't make too much ground up in that year. I think it was 18 or 19, I don't know. But um, we're pressing on. I think, that's, I think that phrase is in Philippians somewhere. I, I press on, right? Not toward the mark of completing preaching through the, <laughs> through the book, but... Let's just think a little bit to just give us a little context, a historical context. The Philippians were the believers in the city of Philippi, and that church was founded by the Apostle Paul on his second uh, trip. Uh, we call it a missionary trip, um, his second journey. Uh, he began that journey going back to churches that he had founded, started on his first journey. And then he got to the end of visiting them, and he thought, well, I should keep going, but he didn't know where. And we have this series of verses where he says he tried to go here, and then he went there, but the Spirit uh, stopped him. And it gets all the way to the end of modern-day Turkey um, in Troas, and like, okay, where, I got to the end, and God hasn't let me go anywhere. And he receives a vision, remember? The Macedonian vision, he receives a vision. A man says, come over and help us. And Luke joins the narrative there and says, and so we determined that we should go, and they went to Philippi. And I always think it's funny, and so I've pointed this out probably every time. I didn't notice it till I studied it. A man said, come and join us, and when he got there, it was just a bunch of women there. Like, where's the man? The man, where's, and, and, and the women, they couldn't, they didn't really have any worship services or anything. There was a place where prayer was wont to be made. The Bible says, and the women were there, and um, and at this point, Paul's uh, team was himself, Silas. He'd picked up Timothy along the way, and Luke was with him, and maybe there were others, but we know those. And they went to this place where prayer was wont to be made. Some women were there. God worked in Lydia's heart. Um, there was a slave girl who got delivered from a demon. And um, that caused an uproar. And so Paul ended up in jail, right? The Philippian jailer and all of that. But from that, there's a group of believers in Philippi. And interestingly, when we get to the next verse, the next time, we'll see that there's women that are in prominence in the Philippian church. They're not leaders, but they're prominent. They're prominent enough to have their names called out in the book of Philippians. And it makes sense when we think back that that's... They started with a bunch of women, women that would pray and all of that. And so, um, but the Philippian church had a special place, we might say, we use the phrase, a special place in their heart for Paul. Paul had a special place in his heart for them. If you recall, when he left Philippi, he, the very next city he went to was Thessalonica. And in another part of the scriptures, or, or he, but we, we learn actually later in the book, that the Philippians sent money to Paul twice while he was in Thessalonica. He wasn't there that long, but they, 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 he, he went down the road and they sent some money to follow him, and then they must have heard of some other need and sent some other money to follow him. They took monetary care of Paul often, and it seems like they lost track of him. His travels, he was going all different places. He ended up, um, well, he... He had sent Timothy and Silas back to Philippi at various times. On his third journey, 
he went back through, or if the map is that way, went back through Philippi, and, and at the end of his third journey, he was uh, taken captive in Jerusalem. He spent two years in Caesarea um, there, and then sailed to Rome and was in house arrest, we would call it, in Rome for two years. Um, toward the end of that two years, Paul's circumstances got worse. We don't know exactly what. When he was first there, he had his own hired house. The end of the book of Acts makes it sound like life wasn't that bad. People could come and go and visit him. But Philippians tells us that his, his circumstances got worse. Um, and the Philippians themselves, their life for the Lord, their interaction with the people in their town caused their circumstances also to get worse. It was discouraging. And um, things were happening among the people of God at Philippi internally that caused things to get worse. There was strife there over and over and over again. And I, I'm going to just repeat this because if I ask right now, what's the theme of Philippians? You're going to say it's joy, but it's really unity. Over and over and over again, he says, I want you to be of one mind. I want you to be of the same mind. Over and over and over again. And why would he say that over and over and over again? Because they weren't. They weren't. There was more, um, somehow, it, it seems to me, in my, the way that the, 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 the book reads, that they lost contact with Paul. They, they didn't know exactly where he was, but after a while, they figured out where he was. He's now in Rome. They got together a gift for him, and they sent it with Epaphroditus. More correspondence went back and forth between them because they heard that Epaphroditus got sick while he was there, and all of this happens. And after that time, Paul writes this book that we can read in about nine or ten minutes. It takes me seven years to get to chapter four, but we could read it in about nine or ten minutes. Paul writes the book of Philippians. It's not like the book of Corinthians. Corinthians, he's addressing this problem and that problem and that problem. While, we can, while I say there was an issue with division among them, he doesn't come right out and say, there's divisions there. He's in a different way addresses that issue. There's no clear like what this book is about. No ethical teaching necessarily. There's not really a chapter on a certain doctrine or everything. It's the scripture and there's all kinds of, uh, there's some of the most amazing doctrine taught to us in the book of Philippians, but it's not like Romans or Colossians. It is the most personal book that he writes to any church. Now, of course, a book to Timothy or Titus is personal, but for a church, this is the most personal book that he writes. And he starts by greeting them, giving thanksgiving for them. Um, he tells them in verses, uh, chapter 1, 12 through 26, how they can look at trouble, how to look at trouble. Things are worse for me, things are for, worse for you, how can you do that? In verses 27 through 30, he tells them to live like the gospel. Remember verse 27? You don't, unless you're looking at it, but only let your conversation become a be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So this is important to Paul right at the beginning of his writing. Verse Chapter 2, he talks about being like-minded. And then we have the centerpiece of the book where he talks about what Christ did, how he emptied himself, made himself of no reputation, and, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and then God exalted him so that someday all will, will kneel before him, calling him Lord. After he gives us that centerpiece, tells uh, them to work out their salvation and shine as light. Talks about how Timothy is an example of Christ-likeness. Timothy, at this point in his life, could, his life, we could see parallels between his life and Christ's life that you see in the beginning of chapter two. And then talks about Epaphroditus himself and it says, hold such in reputation. Recently, I heard some pastors talking about whether Christians should have heroes, and it was a good discussion. 
I enjoyed listening to it. And I got all the way done with it. And, and they were talking like, I don't think the Bible actually talks about heroes or whatever. And finally finished. And I, and, and I remembered this verse or this, cha- this section at the end of chapter 2 where Paul says, hold this, this type of person in reputation. Well, that's what a hero would be. So think about Epaphroditus uh, when you're looking at the type of people to have as a hero. At the beginning of chapter 3, he warns against fleshly Christianity. I'm being very general here. But he warns against fleshly Christianity. And then talks about his own, uh, how he depended on the flesh and how he turned from that so that he could, uh, to follow Christ. And then how he would like to know Christ even better. And then in verse 12 through 16, he, go, he talks about, I haven't arrived yet. Now this is the Apostle Paul. He's been in prison for nearly two years. He's near the end of his ministry. There's a time he'll be out, he'll do more. But he's a man that we would look at and say, he's dedicated his life to the Lord. If I could, get, if I could do a tenth of what he did, I'd be happy. And he says, I haven't arrived. I haven't, appreh- I haven't apprehended I'm, going to pre- I'm not satisfied with where I am in my Christian life. I'm going to be more devoted. I'm going to make sure that my direction is going toward the right, in the right direction. I'm determined. And I'm going to make sure that I stay disciplined in my life. We see those principles in verses 12 through 16. And then I'm going to pick up reading in verse 17 of chapter 3 to, to finalize this, um, this context, this textual context. It says, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us, ye have us for an ensample. An ensample, you, you've gotten a sample of something before, right? This is a sample. He says, you, look at us. We're, we're a sample of what you should be. These people are a sample of what you should be. We, you could use the word example, but that's why the word sample is there. And sample is, it's a, it's a, it's the prototype. It's the thing that the rest of us should be following after. So he's followed me and follow them that, that which walk like me, as you have for an ensample. And skip down after the paragraph, uh, the parenthesis, where it says, for our conversation is in heaven. Now and then go back into the, into the parenthesis, and we have an example of who not to follow. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, their purpose is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So he's built, he's, he's showing us a stark contrast between what not to follow, and clearly, these people that he's describing here want you to follow them. What not to follow, and who to follow. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence or from where also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What, were, what, did, the, what did the group just sing? From, from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So if we look at verse 1 there, coming back there to verse 1, there's a relational setting that he, put, that he puts into there. I don't think you could miss it, could you? Did you miss it? Did you notice there all the loving language he has there? Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, gives him that challenge and then says, my dearly beloved, I'm not going to take the time to study all those words, but the terminology almost, I heard somebody say it almost sounds gushy. 
You think he's just doing that as a rhetorical device? Is he just buttering them up? Of course not. These are the words of Scripture. He does love them. And so just without going into all of that, let's just note that he loved the Philippian believers greatly. And he's, give, and he's also, in the middle of all that love, he's sternly telling them to do something. And so the truth that we can see out of that terminology there is that when you love someone, you will speak truth to them and even command them. When you love somebody, you will tell them the truth and you will even tell them to do things. Don't let the world around you tell you how to love your family. I'm sorry, don't let your children, don't let the world tell your children how you should love them. You love them with God's love and command them with God's word. Don't let the world tell you what love is. They're quite proud of their understanding of love. They think love is love. A self-identifying definition, which is, means nothing. Don't let, don't let the world tell you how to love somebody. They don't have no idea. Don't let the world around you tell you how to allow your pastors to love you. That's actually a more direct application. Here's Paul. I know he wasn't the pastor of the Philippians, and we don't have apostles anymore. We don't have the apostle Dr. Reverend Jeremiah Mitchell as our pastor. <laughs> but he is our pastor. And don't, don't, don't let the world tell you, well, well, if he loved you, he doesn't love you. Don't let that voice in the back of your head say, he doesn't love you. When he tells you something that you need to hear. He tells you to stop doing something. Or gives you counsel to start doing something. The truth is, when someone really loves someone as much as, or a people, as much as we can see in this verse, my brethren, dearly beloved, long for my joy, my crown, they will tell you some things to do. They will command. They will command. Now let's look at that command. The command is stand fast. Stand fast. The word stand fast is a verb. All the grammar teachers just perked up and the rest of you said, okay. It's a verb. It means hold your ground. It means maintain a position. It means don't slide back or give up. It means be steadfast. It's very much like our memory verse for last month. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hold your ground. Are you a believer? Are you a Christian? Stand fast. Hold your ground. Where is the enemy pushing against? That's where you have to stand fast. I don't even have this written down, but if you stand fast in a place where the enemy is not pushing, that doesn't make you a good Christian. It's especially if you're sliding back in the place where he is pushing. But it's a verb, and it means hold your ground. Hold the position. Don't slide back. Be steadfast. It's in the present tense. It's in the present tense. That means that it's, you're not done. If you stood fast, good. But you still need to stand fast now. Do it now. Keep doing it now. Don't stop doing it now. Stand fast. Stand fast today. Stand fast tomorrow. Stand fast next, the next day. Stand fast next week. Stand fast next month. And we could go on and on. It's in the present tense. Stand fast. You don't, don't I get a break? No. We don't. We don't get a break. Now, sometimes we get moved to a different field of service. We get put on a different 
type of duty, and that gives us some variety. Isn't the Lord merciful that way? Allows us to re, um, rejuvenate ourselves in certain ways, but we always must be standing. Stand fast. It's an active verb. It's an active verb. That means there's activity involved. You can't just let it happen. Nobody stands fast without working at it. It's not going to just happen. And it's imperative. I've probably implied that, right? It's an imperative. It's not a statement of facts. We would say, Christians stand fast. That's true, but that's not what Paul said. He didn't say, I want you that I love so much to know that Christians stand fast. No, he said, I want you, you that I love so much to stand fast. You stand fast. As a Christian, there's no choice in this matter. There isn't a choice. He says, stand fast. So what do we do? Stand fast. If we don't, that's disobedience. We must do it. Now, uh, the verb, then, is in the second person. Now, we can see that by the way he's addressing these people. He's addressing them directly. He doesn't use a pronoun here, but he's addressing them directly. He's not talking about himself. He's not talking about somebody else. He's talking to them. So second person means you, right? Remember that? I, you, them. Okay, first person, second person, third person. So it's you. It's not Paul. It's not the leaders. Now, of course, the leaders, we, I have to read this verse myself. But when you read it, he's not talking to me. When you read it, he's talking to you. When I read it, he's not talking to you. When I read it, he's talking to me. You. Not Paul, not the leaders, not others. You. And then, and I'm excited to share this with you, it's plural. It's not you by yourself. It's actually what we would say in the Bible, ye. Ye, together. But let me just say, that doesn't mean that we all, in a sense, we all band arms, yes. What it means is that others are depending on you. Team sports is really good to teach us about the Christian life. And... Um, that's one of the reasons we have sports in our school and, and, and because there's nothing like athletic activity to mimic the field of battle and there's nothing like battle that mimics the realities of Christian life, the spiritual warfare. So, but, but there's the individual sports and there's team sports, you know, the team sports like basketball and volleyball and Soccer or football, whatever you want to call it. Um, these are team sports. But to me, there's a certain kind of team sport that is the pinnacle of athletic activity. It's the pinnacle of athletic, athletic activity. It's a team sport where everybody has to do their part, but the whole team is depending on them to do their part. Track team is like that. You have the 100-yard sprinter and the 200-yard sprinter and, um, you know, in the shot put and the whatever, all the different parts of the event, you have somebody that does that and everyone has to do their part and have to do the best in order for the team to win. But the sport that some of us are much more familiar with that's just like this is wrestling. Um, I think I got this right. I didn't look it up. Mr. Ramis, help me out. As, as long as you're not confused with present day. When I was on the wrestling team, I'm going to look at it to make sure I get what I wrote down earlier right. There was an 85-pounder, a 98-pounder, a 105-pounder. Uh, that, uh, that was Mr. Edwards. No, I wrestled 105 in eighth grade, I think. Long time ago, like almost 100 pounds ago. 112-pounder, 119, 126. Mr. Edwards wrestled 126. 132. 138, 145, 155, 167, 185, and a heavyweight. So you have a wrestling team, 
right? And we all line up at the mat. Skinniest guy, littlest guy over here, all the way down to the heavyweight over there. Every man stands there, and across the mat is the enemy, uh, the opponent. Every single one has a job to do. Each team member must prepare, must compete, must hold on, must fight on his own for the team. Are you overweight? I've been there. I was overweight. Could anybody, on the, uh, uh, could anybody else on the team lend me a pound so that I'd make weight? Nope. I failed the team. What if you're out of shape? Out of shape. What if you stayed up late? Stayed up late. Out there, your brain's foggy. Your arms move half as fast as they normally would because you're gassed. Your brain's dead. You quit easy. He grabbed me hard. Are you a sissy? The 98 pounder could be the toughest, meanest guy. He could be undefeated, but he could be on a team that loses every single match. Every person on that team has to do their part, and they have to fight, wrestle hard. They have to stand fast. And when Paul says to the Philippians, and he says today, tonight, to Fairhaven Baptist Church, stand fast, every single one of you have a place to stand fast. And if you don't stand fast, you fail, you let down the team. We, get, we advance together and we fall together. I'm not going to say it's so integrated that if one person falls, the whole church, you know, sell the buildings, move somewhere else. Not, not saying that. But if we're weak in one place, it's the team that's weak. It's the church that's weak. It's all of us are affected by every single other person. Now, as I was imagining this, I was thinking about the church and all of us standing fast in our place. Mr. Ramis, you could imagine this. Some of you might not, but imagine a dual meet, a dual meet where all the matches are being wrestled at the same time. The 85 pounders on this mat, you got whatever, 12 mats in the gym. You just meet there. It's a 10-minute it's a match. Everybody's wrestling at the same time. Um, maybe the cloud of witnesses is cheering them on, but everybody else has got their own fight to, to, to fight, to battle, to work through. And that's the way we are. Now, we come together here, and we get a little shelter. It's like maybe practice, or it's like whatever. We're in the locker room before we go out those doors and face the world. But we go out, we get into ministry or wherever we are, we all are at it. We all must Stand fast. Every one of us must stand fast in our spot while every one of us stands fast in his spot. Every one of us must stand fast in our spot while every one of us stands fast in our spot. You all must stand firm, stand fast fast right now in your life in your marriage in your family in your ministry in your job 
in the community, wherever it is that you are, we must stand fast. So that's what that verse means. Let's just think of a couple things in application. There are some counterfeits to standing fast. There are some times when somebody thinks they're standing fast or, or, or somebody looks like they're standing fast, but they're not really. I, mean, I just thought of a couple of these. One um, way that we might look like we're standing fast is we're just copying somebody else. Now, don't get me wrong. If you don't know what to do, find somebody else to follow and do what they're doing. But if you're just doing it because somebody else is doing it, you have no, um, you, you're, you have no, uh, no backbone in yourself, no belief in yourself, no commitment to God in yourself, and you're just copying somebody else, um, they're, they're, you, you're, not, you're, you're a counterfeit. You're just copying. Another, I would say, I've been, I've been trying to be bold and tell us that you have to stand fast, but there's some people that have a self-centered stand fastness, self-centered boldness. Nobody ain't telling them what to do. They're going to stay right here and do what they want. Preacher's not going to tell them what to do. No godly friend is going to tell them what to do. Their, their mind is set on doing what they're going to do. And mostly, when it's that way, their mind is set on moving away. They're not standing fast, but they have this bravado, this machismo, this, this some like tough man thing. I'm a man, so you can't tell me what to do. Well, just because you don't want to be told what to do doesn't mean you're standing in the right place and doing the right thing. That could be a counterfeit for standing fast. Then I thought of some opposition to standing fast. Opposition to standing fast. There, there's probably more than this, but as I was thinking through, I thought there's, there's overt opposition. We're standing in our spot, and it's really clear who we're standing against, because they're right there. It's overt. It's out in the open. People will say, that's stupid. People will say, that's out of date. People will say, people, that, oh, that was fine for people 30 years ago, but it's not fine for people now. Whatever. It's open opposition. And that is not something to be laughed at. It's not something to be shrugged off. It can be evil. It can be empowered uh, by the devil with tremendous amounts of power and, and a coordination of people into that. It's, it's, it is a fight that we must stand against and that can weary us. We can get tired. But the scriptures in another place say what? Be not weary in well-doing, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We must stand fast. But there's also a covert opposition. Now, covert operations are under the radar, right? They're the spy operations. They're the ones that are cool to read about. Well, the overt ones are cool to read about, too. Mass and what, D-Day was not that long ago. How many, 150,000 soldiers? Oh, that was kind of overt. Now, it was a little bit of covert there, too. But when you get 150 in one place, it's hard to hide them. Um, but covert operations. You know, there's somebody, maybe it's in your mind, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's somebody at work, maybe it's somebody in this church, says, what if there's a different way to do it? seen other people. There's other people who seem like they're good Christians. They don't do it that way. They don't dress that way. Their skirts, their skirts are, oh, they're not, they're not bad, but they're a little shorter than what we all do here. Their music isn't as stiff as Fairhaven's. That's covert. They're good Christians. They love the Lord. Their pastor loves the Lord. Their pastor might even have preached in chapel. Are you think you're better than them? Now, I'm saying it out loud. This is overt. But this happens in our mind. It happens between friends that are discussion, discussing things. Do we really think we're better than them? Are they weak? Are we that great because we're strong? We have high, strong standards. 
Those are real questions. I'm not going to say that they don't come into our mind. But let me give you an answer. You might not like the answer. But here's an answer that's biblical. Might not even be sufficient, but it's still biblical. And the answer is, they're not here. They're not here. A principle that applies to this is don't judge another man's servant. You ever heard that? It's in the Bible, isn't it? Don't judge another man's servant. This person in another church is taught to live a certain way. They're faithful to the Lord. They're faithful to the church. They're probably standing fast in that way. Don't judge them. You stand fast where God put you. God put you here. Say, well, I'm going to change that. I'm getting tired of this around here. God put you here. Not so that you'd leave. Let me just put it this way. Don't envy another man's servant either. That's a heart problem. Why do I have to be here? Why did God put me here? They're so old-fashioned. They're still doing things they did 30 years ago. The whole world doesn't do anything they did 30 years ago. I, I was, you all remember Barack Obama? That stalwart who ran on a platform that marriage was between one man and one woman for life? Okay, Just because we still believe that doesn't make us old fogies. And we didn't really believe much else than he, I mean, I don't know that he believed it, but he ran on it, right? But the point is, the world is moving. And it's moving faster and faster now. And worldly Christians are moving too. Don't envy somebody that's different than you. That's maybe, you, you know, if you, if you were in their shoes, you'd find out that, they're, that you might, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, I don't know who they are, they, the thing that you're envious of because you've got a world, you, we all have world, we all have flesh that likes that. But the thing that you're envious of and hoping for, if you got there, if it's a strong church, there's going to be something there that you don't like. The problem with going to a new church, because there's problems in your church, is that when you get there, you are there. Your flesh that doesn't like certain things about this church Will be, that strain of flesh will be comfortable in another church and it won't like something else about another church if it's a church that's worth anything. Don't be a caviling coward. Stand fast. Don't entertain those thoughts. Don't like, oh, da, 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 da. What about this? What about, what about these, these friends, these relatives? And you don't have to be... You don't have to be rude to relatives. But you do have to know that they're not a part of your church. And I'm not trying to lift up this church as we, we know. But this is the church God's given us. This is where you are. This is where I am. This is what we do. We're continually striving to be closer to what God wants for us. We're not stuck in an old, in an old way, an old rut that's just doing it well. It ain't never been done any other way before. We're just like, we did it back then, we're going to do it that way forever. That's not the way we think. But we are thinking, we're going to stand fast. We're staying where God wants us, and any movement is going to be closer to what God wants for this church. Amen. There's external opposition. Um... These others up here that we already talked about, the overt and the covert, those can be loud or quiet. External opposition, this person or that person. Still, we must stand fast against it. And then I must say, there can be internal opposition. And I've already hinted toward that, I think. Some of the voices that are trying to get us to quit and give up and lighten up and take an easy path are our own. They're in our own head. They're in the back there, or it's over there, or it's coming from there. But, you know, it's, our, it's your own voice. Our own flesh will tempt and plead with us to take it easy. Maybe just this time you don't have to stand so hard and so stuck right there where you've always been. Isn't there some, there's some extenuating circumstance that we can be able to just do it a little differently? Stand fast. Let's think of a couple reasons 
why we should stand fast. And first is that this life we have, that we stand in, came from Christ. And he paid a tremendous price to give us this life. He left the glories of heaven, came to earth, lived among people that he created who had turned their back on him and didn't want anything to do with him. Lived perfectly, and yet they found some way to kill him in excruciating death on the cross so that every single person that would turn to him could have their sins forgiven, could have a new life, a life worth standing fast in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Christ gave us this life. Don't lose it. Keep it. Occupy till he comes. Stand fast. And then another reason to stand fast is because he's coming back. He's coming again. He's coming again. He's coming again. It may be morning, night, or noon. I forget the tune. But it's not just a, it's not. And we didn't sing it like it was silly, but sometimes we get, oh, he's coming again. What do you want to be doing when he comes? Hopefully it's standing fast in the spot where he left you. He's coming. Be standing fast when he does. And the last thing I'd like to just mention is how. How can we stand fast? Well, the verse says, so in this way, and there will be some things in the verses that follow that will be specific things, but right here it says, so stand fast in the Lord. Don't stand in your own strength. Don't stand propped up by somebody else's spirituality. Stand fast in the Lord. And these verses, start, verse, the whole book, but verses, verse 12 of chapter 3 and 13 and 14 and 15, all the way through this, these things specifically are telling us how do we stand fast in the Lord? Don't settle back. Don't become satisfied with where you are. Keep a holy, godly dissatisfaction so that we're pressing, I follow after so that I may apprehend that for which I'm apprehended of Christ. I press toward the mark. This one thing I do. Keep those things in your life, a devotion and a direction and determination and dis discipline. Right before this, he says, what, what does he say in verse... Um, be followers together of me. Follow good men. Follow godly men. Obst reject those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Follow the right leaders. Stay in the Lord and get strength from the Lord. How do we stand fast? It gets tiring, it, we get wearied. Stand in the Lord. Get strength from the Lord. So I think you know what the theme of tonight's message is, right? Stand fast. Stand fast. Everybody needs to stand fast. But God's created us in such a way that men, this is our job. Stand fast. Fast. What area do you need to stand fast in today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we all need this. To deliver your word, I have to speak with boldness. But Lord, I know I need to stand fast. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us even before we start a time of playing music for an invitation, we would just think, Lord, where do I need to bolster the defenses? Where do I need to strengthen my stance? Where do I need to stand firm? Where do I need to repair the breach? Lord, please, Use your word 
to help and strengthen the men and the members of our church so that we may be a lighthouse to our community and even through our members around the world of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.